Growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi everyone, Dr. Steve Rasner here. Welcome back to the Lionhearted Dental Podcast. I have a lot of things I want to talk about this week. Some of them are a little bit random, but all of them are going to help you. I first want to thank you guys for the resurgence I've experienced lately in my podcast. I was so bummed out two months ago. It was my own fault. I think my podcast got stale and uninteresting. And that's called being accountable. I think I even said that to you. So, but we bounced back and quite a number of downloads all across the globe. So thank you. Continue thank you to United Kingdom. I hope it's more than a couple people because there's a lot of downloads going on there. And hey, have me over for a lecture. I, I can do things like that. I have the freedom to change my schedule or adapt to your schedule and give you a live day of Lionhearted. Thank you to Canada, Germany, all the European countries and everybody that tunes in. If you don't know by now that I am just sincere, one voice albeit, trying to give you something weekly that will, I don't know, make you think, then you're not really listening if you don't believe that because that's what it is. I looked at my podcast from last week. I have to thank you for not making fun of the way <laughs> the way that I looked. I don't know what went on there, but... Uh, dreadful would be an adequate description of my appearance last podcast. Hopefully most of you just listened to me. Okay, I want to give you, remember, ever since I'd say four or five podcasts ago, I've really tried to give you things and then explain how to do them that you can do the next time you're in the operatory, the next time you're in your office. That's the way it should be. And I want to give you this one because I thought about it in the last week. And it's about case presentation. Now, I know I beat that subject to death. And why shouldn't I? Because it determines every facet of everything you think about dentistry. Do you not believe that? If you have an insurance-driven practice, and that's what your treatment plans are about, then what I'm just saying is, I don't think you're the one that's listening to this podcast, to be quite honest. Unless you're trying to get out of that horrible situation that you've worked so hard. I mean, you are a doctor of dentistry. You know so much. You deserve to take it a few more steps you're there. So you you deserve to take it a few more steps and maximize your fulfillment. It doesn't even have to be a financial thing. It's how you spend your days each day. I know you've heard me say this, and I don't have a schedule near me right now. But honestly, when I pull back out of the uh, day, any random of the week, any random schedule, and I look down and I see a free gingival graft at 9 o'clock. Today, an open flap curatage and some GBR around teeth, by the way, that I don't really do that often. It's got to be the exact right patient with the exact defects in their bone that I think will be worthy of going in there and doing a debridement. And there's so many facets that go into that particular procedure. Suturing, the use of PRF. You know what it is? It's a lot of training that I invested in. The same training I implore you to do. And I mean live training, by the way. Maybe I do a couple endos. I don't do much endo per week. And my point is, it's hard not to feel complete in my profession when I'm having those kind of weeks, week to week. And I know many of you 
that listen to me are either doing that or on, on the way to doing that. And I see lots of your stuff, those of you that I know personally now on social media, and a lot of your work blows mine away, by the way. At least to me it does. Some of you I, uh, are just astonishingly good at endo and direct restorative procedures. But the takeaway of what I'm saying right now is it all starts, does it not, with what's going on during that time period that a patient's in the chair and you are about to talk about recommended treatment. And the moment of this podcast for this week is for you to present treatment recommendations or meet a new patient, and here it is, be in the moment. Do not be anywhere else. Do not be in the operatory down the hall. Do not be thinking about the hygiene recall check you have to do. And do not be thinking about anything but what's happening right that minute with that patient. I don't think many of you do that let alone to the level, those of you that do, I'm not sure you do it to the level that I need you to do it. Practice in the moment. Be present. Be mindful of everything that's going on. And you can't be clear enough verbally in whatever it is you're thinking. I'll say it again. You can't be clear enough. Like if your mind, you're saying, as you're speaking, should I say this? Say it. You can't be clear enough. Let, let, me, let me break this down for you. Do you ever stop and think what's going on here in that moment I'm talking about? Do you ever stop and think, I, I actually say it to the patient. Let, let me give you some examples. And I wrote a couple down this week, okay? I had uh, earlier in the week a new patient that was a policeman, okay? In my chair, 49 years old. Chief complaint was he wanted a new dentist. He just felt that where he had been receiving care was not really into it. And now I've said what I'm going to say to you right now in different versions, but I'm going to say it again tonight. So he's in the chair. His wife which I think is a very good sign, a very big deal, is in the chairs that I have purchased over the years in my operatories. If you want them, by the way, they're wonderful. They're not that big. They're extremely comfortable. They fold up nicely and they're on wheels. I'll tell you where we got them. So they're in every operatory. And when I see a significant other in the operatory, I know that the message got through from my new patient coordinator that that's a good idea if the patient indicated in any way that they may need more than just a checkup, okay? And when I, I want to tell you some of the things I said. So because when I walk in and, and it's my moment, the x-rays are taken, the patients have been charted, maybe he's been in my office a solid 30 minutes. Paperwork, unless he did it online, might even be a few more minutes. And... I have dedicated time, time in the arena, I would say, of 30 minutes to an hour. That's it, of my time. And it rarely would take me an hour. Always takes me 30 to go over and get into where we going with this. But I say some things that I think all of you could adopt that would bring up your case acceptance to significantly higher levels. And I've said it before, as I've alluded to, but one of the things that gets me in the moment, particularly, I mean, is it not true when you look at your patients, new patients, and you walk in and you look on the x-rays for just a few minutes, you're getting a pretty good sense, are you not, where this patient is going? I mean, is it dreadful um, perio, right? And if that was the case and they had greater than 60% loss of osseous generalized, 
you bet I'd be looking at the pre-treatment notes of what they said the problem was when they called. I had a patient come in uh, just yesterday. I'll get back to the policeman in a minute. And this patient was 17 years old. And my hygienist who took the radiographs described her as aloof. That would be a remarkable understatement. I walk into this patient. She is blown out at 17 years old. I am talking the need for multiple loss of teeth, four or five root canals. The daughter, by the way, of one of my patients who has fallen on hard times. This patient's in a wheelchair, the, the mother. The patient's had cancer. So I, and, and she's sweet as sugar, and she's in the operatory in her wheelchair with her daughter patient that she brought to me. And I know in two minutes that this requires a different approach than I normally give because this is massive. And I tried very hard to relate to the patient, to get a barometer, a sense of where she was and it was totally hopeless. I am telling you, if I tell you it's hopeless, it's hopeless. Um, this was a patient that had, in my opinion, problems far beyond oral health care problems. Had, and she was asymptomatic, by the way. She's the poster child for what I talk to you about all the time. And why I tell you, it's our responsibility to take the time and thoroughness to go through the five arenas of a patient's examination, from their periodontium to their teeth, missing teeth, joints and muscles, mis and uh, aesthetics. She had them all, but she didn't have any pain. And I'm only telling you that because that's what I mean, that you get a sense. And I also get a sense very quickly of somebody that went to good old Joe. Now, you've heard me describe good old Joe before. And I mean no offense to anybody listening who might think they're good old Joe. I'm just telling it the way it is. So good old Joe to me is when I'm looking at a patient with multiple root canals. Hold on. Maybe one or two missing teeth. All the root canals are not restored. They're restored with uh, MOD, BL, MOUSE restorations. It's obviously just somebody who was intimidated from the beginning or got sidetracked by the insurance company's maximum and just never completed restorative work. And the problem with that is for us, for the dentists that listen to us, to me, that want to provide comprehensive care, it, it's the road less travel is not always the road less accepted. Because you can look greedy. You can look egregious. Which brings me to what I say in the beginning. So please take this. If you take nothing else tonight, take this. When I walk into the room, I'm very colloquial. Hey, guys. How you doing? Where are you from? And um, how did you find me? That's really important for me. Because if their relative sent them to me, if somebody, a coworker, it's way more significant than even they Googled me, which I hear more and more. So I want to ask them that. Uh, and then I say this, I say, listen, I know this sounds a little different, but before I really even get going, I want to tell you a little bit about where you're sitting. Because you could have gone to 50 other doctors within 45 minutes from here, 50 other dentists, and we're all different. So, by the way, what do you do? Right, this is my opening, guys. And it's done with very careful tone of voice inflections, so it can't be misconstrued. And they'll usually tell me whatever it is. This particular person told me he was a police officer. And I'll even go to a significant other in the chair in the corner of the room and I'll say, how about yourself? What, do you have an occupation? And they'll tell me. I'll say, so 
Isn't it true, do you agree, that whether you're a policeman, a lawyer, cop, teacher, dentist, we're not all in at the same level. You can have a job and like it, but it doesn't mean it's the center of your universe, right? Or you're okay with it. And that's very true about dentistry. I said, in fact, in dentistry, I believe it's even more profound because it's a really hard profession. I don't say what I'm saying every time, but if I'm getting ready to do a good old Joe story, I do. I said, it's a, it's a hard profession and it's easy to burn out. And the, diff- and the thing, if you're a dentist, and I kind of like look around at the operatory, it's not so easy to get out if you want to get out. You have a big investment and they get it. I can tell by, for 40 years of this, I can tell by their body language. I can tell by their eye. They get me. They know what I'm saying. Sometimes I'll say, like in this case, I said, do all policemen invest the same amount in the education and training to become a top caliber police officer? Whether it's breaking down hostile situations, investigations, target shooting, whatever. They get it. And so so the same is true in my profession. And you're sitting in a place where I went all in. I went all in 40 years ago. You can say, if you've been practicing for two years, I went in all in from the beginning, if that's true. I take as much CE as you can humanly take. And I say that with total conviction to them. And so, this is, imp- this is where I'm going with this. This is the takeaway for you. Because depending on what I know about them, like if I know they're there because of fear, and you know that I market sedation all the time. So a lot of people come to me for no other reason than they're very scared and they heard we're very good with that. Okay? But I'll say to the patient, if it's not a fear, fear patient, so if it's a fear patient, and I know that, I will get right into it. I'll say, you know, one of the things I learned years ago is the most incredibly well-kept secret in my industry, and that's how to orally, consciously sedate a patient safely so they act basically sleep while I'm working. It's amazing. And I say it with such conviction, because it is amazing, that the patient can feel the confidence, as they should. But what I say to most people is this. I said, what I learned the most is what I call what to do when. Just like that. I said, because I always am in that minute. I'm in it right now with you. I didn't know you an hour ago. Now you're sitting in my dental chair. Sometimes I'll say, if we had the time to send you out on an investigative documentary and you could visit 10 dentists, do you think you would get just one opinion? You'd get a lot of opinions. You would get dentists that would probably be egregious. They would over-treat some things. And you would also get dentists that do just as bad. They are what I call good old Dr. Joe's, and they just, and you love this guy, by the way. I say it just like that. You love good old Dr. Joe because you never spend any money or time in his chair. He tells you, we're going to watch it. You'll be okay. He patches this. He patches that. And Patients totally get that. And you should believe that they get it because they're in your office. They're in your operatories every week. New patients come to you. They're missing a couple teeth. You can tell by their oral health. I'm not talking about patients that didn't go to the dentist. I am talking about patients that had regular care, that have missing teeth. Let's not pull any punches here tonight. Just like a pitcher in, in Major League Baseball knows exactly what pitch he threw seven years ago to the batter that hit a home run. We know in seconds, do we not, what kind of basic care a patient has had. You can tell by the direct restorative procedures. You can tell by the endo. And it's just of a, a wonderful feeling as I'm, to me as I'm sure it is to many of you, when the care is beautiful. We love that, and I comment on it all the time. Because the truth is, unfortunately, regrettably, 
it often isn't wonderful and it's offensive. This patient went to the trouble of spending the money and trying to do things and know what they're all lacking that go to good old Dr. Joe's. They're lacking a treatment plan. That's what's going on. Somehow in the conversation of the dentist sitting in front of the patient, the patient overtook the situation, overrode the, den the, the dentist intention, and it became an insurance-driven treatment plan where the patient's treatment was determined by their maximum. Just, it's so, I don't know if you get it, those of you listening, how absurd to practice dentistry that way it is. Back to my policeman, who I looked at, so because he looked quality to me. And I'm wondering, he had, he needed six full coverage restorations. He had nice perio. Okay, this guy went to the dentist. He had four root canals, no full coverage on any of the root canals. And they were all broken. I mean, I think as one of his chief complaints was broken and missing teeth. He was missing four and 12. By the way, abundant bone for implants in those two areas. So I said to him, oh, an hour ago, you didn't even know me. And here I am, and, and I'm about to talk to you about what I would do if I was you. And I have to say to you, now when I'm talking to him, by the way, he's like this, he's sitting up. It doesn't take me more than the time I've looked already to kind of know what kind of care you've had. You had great root canals done. They just weren't finished. And I go into why we full coverage most root canal teeth. And he seemed to get it because I spoke with authority and I wasn't selling him anything. I never go in with the intention of selling him anything. And so I said, this is what I'm going to do. And by, well, let me say one more thing. Always tell the patient something good if it's there to be told. So the guy had great perio, no bone loss, good hygiene. The first thing I said is, let me tell you about the good stuff. Your hygiene is impeccable. It actually doesn't go with your teeth. And I know nobody's spoken to you about this before because I think you would have done something about it. I, why would you go to the trouble of root canaling four teeth because you want to keep them? And then you didn't finish those teeth with complete restorations. I said, do you know that I pull at least one tooth per month on a root canal tooth that somebody sat for, spent money on, and it, because the tooth split. And I explain why they're more fragile than teeth that aren't root canal. And then I went into the missing teeth, which was a little bit on the edge because that was going to dramatically up the fee. I knew that. And I would have been fine if he finished phase one and we went back and did four and 12 implants later. I, I'm, I'm fine with any treatment plan as long as I can stand in front of it and represent it to a board of dentistry. I mean it. So then I had a patient today. Now, this was a really hard one. I want to tell you about it because it's a different approach. And it's about being in the moment. So I want you to picture this. A 79-year-old mother-in-law in my chair with a little bit of dementia. Maybe a little bit more than a little bit. And her, her daughter-in-law was a significant other for me to deal with. So it was her son couldn't be there. And her chief complaint was that she broke off five, six, and seven to the gingival margin. When I looked in an exam, she's loaded with circumferential caries. Have you ever see that on one of your patients where it's like a beaver went around their teeth at the gum line and there was significant caries everywhere. So when I told him about what I just said to you, when I said there's all kinds of dentists that you could be, you could be going to, and I spoke about how passionate and into it I am. And I telling you that because my favorite course is called What to Do When. And I get into, you walked in here. Now, when I'm talking, 
I'm talking to both a lot. Because I, I can't tell who's got the decision making here. And I don't have the sun, by the way. But when I look at this patient, trust me, the last thing she thought I was going to recommend was full maxillary extractions, which I did. Because it was either that or full coverage on 8 through 13, because she couldn't save 14 and 15. My colleagues in other countries, she couldn't save 2, 6, and 2, 7. And there was nothing on the right side distal to 1, 1. Nothing. So what was the point? She certainly wasn't going for implants, nor should she. She was healthy. I just had a, a level of dimension. I wasn't that prepared for it. My point is, as I said, remember I said, be in the moment. You can't be clear enough about whatever you're thinking. And I said, listen, here's the truth. I don't know how we can make a decision here without talking to the main person that influences Donna. That was her name. And she's there. And I'm saying that to her, but I don't know how much that resonated. And I'm looking at her daughter-in-law the whole time. I said, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. I'm going to tell you that I'm recommending we remove her upper teeth. Now, I and, it, and by the way, I have my 3D models, and I'm really going out of my way to show this patient what a denture is like. Because maybe she would say, and I put a denture in her hand, and I had the arch that the denture was made on in my other hand. And I'm saying, this is what you're going to end up with, so that her daughter-in-law saw it too. And her daughter-in-law was blown away that this is what I was recommending. I said, on your lower, we're going to maintain the lower eight teeth. There's only two of the eight that need significant work, and the rest we can um, maintain with good perio. I didn't say the perio. And we're not even going to go for a lower partial. So... The reason I'm not doing that is because I want to minimize what Dorothy has to get used to. I mean, she's 79 years old and she's never worn anything. And she's only here because she broke off teeth. And she broke the teeth off because they were all carious. All her teeth on the maxilla were carious. And my point is, as I said, look, I know that's not what you were thinking. And when I was really directing it towards the daughter-in-law. And I also said, I think what you need to do is just hear me out today. You know, I, I've said on many other podcasts, I often present day one. You can't present day one in this case. I said, I need to speak to the son. And then I need you, three of you, without me present, Dorothy, her daughter-in-law and her son, to do their best job at home, because I also said, you know what else? You could do nothing. You risk infection, swelling, pain, that you don't have right now. But since you don't have that right now, I don't know, you could take a week, a two, a two, a month, and think about what you really want to do. I have no idea when your immunological system will react to the pathology in your mouth which it certainly could do tomorrow, or not for months. I'm talking slow. I don't know if you guys are getting it. I don't know if I'm messing this up tonight with you. But what I noticed about myself in recent, I'd say, a couple years, is I'm really articulating what I think they're thinking, or I don't want them to think. That I know they just met me. And I know they've never had anybody really speak to them this way. And I realize it's a serious investment. When I'm looking in their mouth, because so I look at their x-rays, I talk to them, I get a feel, I lay them back and I look, I do an intraoral exam. If I think it is not something I can easily sequence and do phase one, sometimes you can absolutely do that, that, I, that it's going to be a big investment. I will sit them back up right away. I'll say, listen, the way I do an exam, 
hear what I'm saying to you right now. I set them back up and say, when I'm in an exam, when I start looking at you, I really can see things. I can see things that I can't see just from looking at your radiographs. And when I see stuff, sometimes I stop what I'm doing and I talk to you like I'm talking now. Because now I need to know from you more about where your head's at and your mind relative to your mouth. And if they said to me, well, what's my insurance cover? You know what I would say? I say, this is so far past what your insurance is going to cover, which I had to say to the policeman at one point. Do you, how could you not say that? It was obvious that his whole mouth was treatment plan according to what his insurance covered. So I said, we are so far past that. And look at me. I not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to talk you anything. I am talking to you that this was my mouth. You're my brother. Whatever. This is what you need to think about if you care about getting to a better place. You must care. You called to come in here. And remember I've said, and I'll say it to you again, and I know I've said this many times. I've said, even if they don't do anything, I'm... My goal is to have them leave the, with the feeling that I am honest, ethical. This was a, not an attempt to jam an all-on six down their throat. Because I could care less. I'm dead serious, too. I don't care. I mean, I have so many patients that shockingly, like I, when I'm done, what happens? I said, you know, so what's going to happen next is... Michelle, who you met, is figuring out the, the monetary part of this. I don't scoop past that. The dollars and cents, and does this, does this really work in your world? That's her job. And I can't say much more until she does that. If it works, I can tell you what we're going to do first. And I don't know how a patient could ever say that Steve Rasner jammed something down her throat. No pun intended that I was all about to sell because I'm not. Because there's so many people, when you take this approach, what's the approach? A comprehensive care approach. What can you do in phase one? What can you really do in phase two? That's got nothing to do with their insurance coverage. It's ridiculous. When you're honest and sincere, is this not true about everything in life? People can hear you. They can see you. I mean, I think if you're out there taking courses on how to get people to say yes, I think that's that's not what I'm here to tell you about on the Lionhearted. And I am telling you is that if you take the approach and you're looking at a comprehensive care approach, which is really what to do when, if you're slow and you speak clearly and you think that you should say something that will get you more, then say it that you're never judgmental, for God's sakes. You're never talking down to them. That you are want to be, you want to be their dentist. You want to be part of this team. You know, I had one more patient I'll tell you about today. And when I left, because when I leave, I go into Michelle, who's my new patient coordinator, who spoke to this patient, who set the appointment, who had a one-to-one -one interview before I walked in the room. She knows them. And I go to her afterwards and I've been with him a lot longer than she was, so I can tell her what I think. And I'll say, this is what you should go in and start with. With the patient I'm about to tell you about, I said, this patient doesn't belong in this practice. And I'm telling you that because the patient badmouthed her last dentist. The patient had need for a crown on two adjacent teeth. Anybody listening, any first-year dental student would diagnose that treatment, and she wanted me to treat one tooth. Likewise, she wanted me to do a restoration on the contralateral arch and ignore two cavities on the roots of two adjacent teeth there. It was very clear to me this was a bad match, and we did a bad job of screening. It's all. It was a couple steps away from a patient telling me they just want their tooth pulled. I've told you in the past that we screen patients so I don't end up with an hour of wasted time. 
I'm going to get back on something else next week. I promised you last week I would do it about how to manage your team and staff during this post COVID crisis. When we are very vulnerable as practice owners, I will tell you, I am not vulnerable and I don't bend and give signing bonuses and give outlandish $5 an hour raises that didn't exist pre-COVID. And I'll tell you how and why I'm able to do that. And I promise, because I'm going to write myself a note, that I will explain how I'm managing my staff, period, in the post-COVID. And I told you last year, 2021, we had the best year I've ever had in practice. And I certainly didn't do that alone. I did it with a team that was accountable, responsible, and I don't have turnover of significance by any stretch of imagination. We have a wait list of people that want to get in. I'm not kidding. I have interviews when I don't even have openings. So we should talk about that next week. I th- This case presentation stuff came up this last couple of days, and I found myself in the moment more, and I wanted to share that with you. I hope it came across. Thanks for listening, guys. Come on, man. We can do this. Please write to me. A lot of you did, by the way, after the protocol book episode from a couple weeks ago. And I offered to give the protocol book that I wrote in 2008, I think, for free, which I charge for $180. Look it up on Google. You might be able to look through it a little bit or, or parts of it. It's an amazing book. I do want something for it. Either you join me on Instagram or Facebook or do something. I mean, that's not asking a lot, is it? I don't think. So either you on join me on Instagram, follow me and say, can I have your protocol book? And I will email it to you. Thanks for listening. Have a great week. See you next week.